All right, hello, my name is Evan. I'm, at, I'm here at Sarah Laser and I'm gonna be doing a light weld uh, demonstration for you today. So I have your parts and I've gone through and kind of just checked them out and seen how they go together. I've done uh, some minor tack welding just so I can save some time overall, um, but I've left uh, examples of tack welding as well. Um, but yeah, so with these demonstrations, I'm gonna go over the, uh, the safety as far as the PPE with this process. Um, I'm also going to talk about the, the unit, um, how you're going to give it power, um, how it operates, and uh, what kind of consumables you're going to need. And then I'll, I'll get into doing some welding uh, towards the end. So, um, so yeah, th this process, you're going to be welding with a focused beam of infrared light. Um, so with that comes a different set of risks. Uh, compared to your your standard um, arc welding process. Um, so like a TIG welding or MIG welding process is going to produce a large amount of UV light. Um, that light stops at the surface of your eye. It won't go, um, you know, and be focused by your eye. That's the main difference. The, the infrared light produced by the laser can be focused by the eye. So it's real important to be wearing these glasses. Um, they're going to filter out uh, that light so that our eyes are safe during this process. Uh, so that's the main difference there. Uh, actually, there's a lot less risk to your skin and um, and other things that are susceptible to UV exposure since there is no UV light produced by the laser. Um, it's just a different type of light, so we have to wear a different type of PPE. So this is what's really uh, important to wear, these glasses. They're really easy to see through and they double as safety glasses. So I just wear them around the shop typically. Um, other than that, we are gonna be wearing our standard welding equipment. Um, there's not the risk of sunburn with this process, but it's still recommended to cover your skin and wear non-flammable clothing uh, just because we're dealing with hot material. The welding hood we're gonna use is uh, has a little bit of a modification made to it as well. Um, it, it's a standard hood uh, on this side, you can see. We're actually gonna have it either set to cut or grind mode, not weld mode, because it's really hard to see with weld mode. It's not as bright of a process. And I, I set my shade to five typically. Um, the difference on the front here is this aluminum shield and this layer of glass here. Um, so the glasses are gonna be protecting our eyes, but uh, since our hands and our face are gonna be the closest thing to the weld, it's important that we protect our face as well. And the plastic of the helmet is not the best at uh, stopping the laser. So this um, thin aluminum here is going to do a great job at making sure any re reflected light that comes back towards our face is redirected in a, a different direction. Um, it's unlikely for it to come straight towards your face unless you're using it improperly or in not the optimal angle, but um, it is possible. So this is provided with the system as well as one pair of glasses. That, this is an added precaution. Uh, these are going to be doing all the protection of our eyes. This is just for our, uh, for our face. Uh, so I'll be wearing the combination of those two. I'm also gonna just be wearing some standard uh, gloves. And um, I'm wearing long sleeves today, but typically I actually weld with, uh, with short sleeves um, in our location. Not what's recommended, but uh, there is no sunburn that's gonna occur on my skin. Um, I'm very pale and I don't, I don't get sunburn from this. So, but, but it is recommended to wear your standard welding equipment. Um, other than that, um, the welding area uh, should be considered a laser controlled environment. So whereas your typical welding cell might have, uh, you know, UV curtains to prevent people from getting arc flash when they're walking by, um, the laser is not going to be stopped by those curtains. So you want some type of physical barrier. Uh, the room that I'm standing in is We've made it out of aluminum, and, and we, we offer a product line of these modular aluminum uh, welding rooms. Um, but it doesn't have to be aluminum. Any any uh, material, preferably non-flammable, that's um, going to block the light from passing through is, is, is what you need, essentially. Um, and so the reason for that is just we, we only want to have to wear glasses if we're in the welding area. Um, if you didn't have a room and you were welding in an open in an open building, or say that like this is a small welding booth about eight by ten feet, 
uh, inside of a bigger room. Um, if I wasn't in this welding cell, everybody in this room would need to make sure they're wearing these glasses. And we do that from time to time when we have bigger things to weld. Uh, but it's just a, you know, limiting the space you're welding in limits the amount of people who need to wear PPE. Um, so yeah, and then another thing to touch on is that the door to this room, the sliding door, it has an interlock switch on it. So uh, something the welder needs to see as a, as a circuit that is satisfied in order to fire the laser is a uh, door interlock switch. So um, that ensures that if somebody were to open the door to come into the welding space, the laser uh, can no longer fire and can no longer pose a risk to their eyesight. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the safety. It's a little different than your standard welding process, but it's not too uh, difficult to uh, to meet those uh, meet those things. And once you're uh, wearing the proper PPE and you're you're making sure you're doing it in a safe manner, uh, it's a very safe process. I've definitely burnt myself a lot more with my TIG welding than I have with this. Um, and obviously, my eyes are going to be safe wearing wearing these glasses. So. Okay, so I'll move on from the safety. Any any questions about that? I don't think so. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so over here is the light weld. I'm going to be using this one today, which is an XR. It's a little different than your typical one that you'll see. Most XRs are copper colored here, but this is like a really early uh, version of it. There's an XC model right next to it. Uh, there's actually three different models of the light weld, the base model, the XC, and then the XR. Uh, in that order, the price increases. So like this is the top of the line one, this is the middle range, and then uh, I, I don't have the bottom range one here with me right now. Uh, the difference between the three is that um, the base model and the XC both have the same welding capability with a preset with the ability to weld between 40 thousandths and just under three sixteenths of an inch with the factory setting. You can kind of push those limits uh, by making your own settings, but right out of the box, you, you have between about 40 thousandths and three sixteenths that you can work with easily. Um, they're multi-mode fiber lasers, so uh, it doesn't have quite the energy density that the XR has. This is a single mode fiber laser. Um, so what, what that means is that this one is gonna, the laser is going to um, hit the material in a smaller space with the same amount of power. So it's more energy dense and therefore capable of penetrating deeper into the material. And it also ends up having more control when you're working with thinner materials. You can turn the power down more and still melt the material. Um, so this one kind of opens your envelope and uh, does everything these ones do and then broadens that a little bit. Um, and then the difference between the base model and then the XC right here, I said they have the same welding capability, is that the XC is, uh, it has an additional function which can perform laser cleaning. And that process can remove discoloration from the material after welding. It can remove oxides off the surface uh, prior to welding or after, the, after welding. They can actually do some passivation if you do it in the correct manner. <clears throat> and basically it's doing an ablation technique and removing uh, contaminants off the surface of the metal, leaving it a clean, a nice clean piece of metal there. Now this one does that too though. So the XR does everything the other ones do and more. Uh, I'm using this one just because it's what I'm set up for. I do prefer the XR with its more higher energy density with materials. Um, you know, any kind of thinner material, this, this is not very thin for the light weld, but I do think the XR is going to handle this a little bit better. Um, although I could definitely do the part that's in front of me with any of them, actually. Um, but, but the XR will have a little more control with the power down low. Um, I'm, I'm going to be welding this at about, I'd say, a third power, maybe a little over a third of the max power. So uh, just, to, just to show you that this isn't actually um, you know, as low as it'll go as far as the power goes. I've, I've been able to weld down into the, you know, five, ten thousand range with this one. Um, I had to screw with the settings a little bit, but, you know, just, just to give you an idea. Um, okay, so the light weld is a air-cooled fiber laser, so it has cooling fans on top. 
that's going to allow it to run at 100% duty cycle in most environments. Um, if the ambient temperature goes up to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that duty cycle is lowered to about 90%. Um, it runs on single phase 220 volt power. A 30 amp breaker is all you're going to need. And it has a really long lifespan. So it's rated to maintain its 1500 watt output power for 100,000 hours of laser emission. So that's a lot of welding time. Um, and the reason for that is that the so 1500 watts is going to be your typical max output power, but the source inside is actually 3000 watts. So it has a long time before that 3000 watts will degrade to the point where it hits 1500 watts. So the advertised power will last for that long. Um, there's been no failures of the laser source so far. Um, the only damages that have been experienced are, um, you know, if somebody breaks the gun or something like that, but the, the actual laser source is extremely robust. And yeah, so um, moving on to the, how it operates. In most instances, I'm going to go ahead and use these preset modes that are created by the manufacturer in order to select my welding parameters. Um, if I want to do some more in-depth stuff, I can create my own modes using the laptop. I can uh, plug it into here, and it allows you to uh, basically have a little bit greater control over the laser. But uh, these preset modes are, are all you need in most instances. It's all, all I'm going to use for uh, this weldment today. So you can see there's uh, some different tables. This one is for fuse welding. This one's for tack welding. Here's cleaning. And then this is going to be wire welding. And there's some setup information and various recommendations for safety and stuff like that on here as well. Um, for these parts, I'm going to start off by tack welding them together. Uh, do a couple little spots here and there just to show you that. So my first setting is going to be stainless steel. I have nitrogen gas as my field gas, A0. So I'll go here. I select through the preset modes here. So we're already on A, but if I wanted to change that, it would be a press and hold of these buttons. And then I need to change this one to zero. So we are currently at eight. I just need to press this until we get to zero. So it says tack A0. And for this material thickness, um, looks like it's roughly 16 gauge. I'm going to probably be in the 300 to 400 watt range. Um, so based on how deep I want to penetrate into the material, I'll select a power. So I'm going to go to about probably 350 to slide into 300 to 400. You'll see. And so that's how I would set my setting for tack welding. And uh, so what's going to happen then is I'll pull the trigger of the, the welding gun and it'll fire the laser and turn off at a timed interval so that I have consistent tack weld. And then um, whether or not I'm going to be fuse welding or wire welding from there, I would go here and select my next setting. So the next one's likely to be A1, uh, roughly 500 or so watts. 450 to 500 if I'm fusion welding. And then if I'm wire welding, it's going to be A2 and probably uh, six or 700 watts, somewhere in there. And then this one also tells me the speed to set my wire feeder at, so 70 centimeters a minute. Um, but again, so I'm the gonna wire welding is the only one that uses any filler metal, correct? The other yes. two are just the laser, okay. Yeah, so if you're gonna do a fuse weld, the only thing to consider is that your part fitment has to be perfect. Uh, there can't be any gaps if you're gonna fuse weld. It, it has to be touching. Um, so I think a lot of this, like I kind of tacked up this part, I left the last one to show you, but like these parts you could fuse weld if you wanted. Um, the wire weld would work just as well. You might introduce a little less heat, a little less distortion with fusion welding. Um, you know, this one you could fuse weld. 
But what I noticed uh, just when I was kind of playing with this is that when this ring is brought together, because of the end of this, um, you know, where, where this part was rolled, the end is a little bit straighter. It doesn't have the curvature to it. Uh, it doesn't sit right on that ring. So if you wanted to fuse weld that, you probably have to kind of tap it into place to bring that gap down and then fuse weld it. Um, for any little gap, you're going to want to use the wire. Um, what I use fuse welding for a lot is, uh, you know, like if it's a two joint or, um, you know, any basically any joint where they're touching really nicely and uh, I can use the fuse weld. If I want to add a little bit more structure to that joint, I'll use the wire, it gives it a bigger fillet. Um, still a very small appearing weld on the surface, um, but the laser penetrates really deep into the metal, so it, it creates a strong joint, even though the weld appears smaller than what you'd be used to the big bit in most instances. Does the laser light actually like penetrate through the metal or is it just heat the surface and the, the heat conducts into the metal to melt it? No, it penetrates into the metal like like as if it were being laser cut. Maybe show them the drawing. Yeah, yeah, I'll kind of draw it for you. Um, I'll get you a piece the, of paper. The, the reason that the uh, laser has most of its benefits um, are due to the fact that it's not just conducting heat through the material and uh, causing a lot of excess heat. So like your TIG welding process, uh, and your MIG welding process, you're wasting a lot of energy uh, overheating metal that you don't need to melt. Also, uh, it ends up destroying the natural properties of the metal in the surrounding area. So uh, the laser just kind of gets right where it needs to go and, and uh, does its work. I'm just going to draw this for you here. I'm going to draw two butt joints from a, a side view, a cross section. One with laser, and then the other one I'll, I'll use TIG for the example, but it's pretty much the same as your other arc process. This will be TIG. Okay, uh, so with your TIG process, you're gonna have an arc um, that's in, inputting heat here, and that heat is banded throughout the material uh, in a radial fashion from that point. You have filler metal, it's gonna add a little bit there. And so your weld ends up shaped something like this. A lot of that energy that you're inputting is being wasted in the surrounding material. So that's what creates quite a large heat affected zone. Right. Um, and then this takes a while. Uh, you have to wait for that process to take place. Um, it's very picky about the standoff distance. So the technique is really important. Um, your shield gas coverage needs to be really good because you have a large area that's actually going to be reacting with oxygen. And then also um, the contamination on the surface is really important uh, because it can disrupt this arc and then cause your weld penetration to be unstable. Um, and then also the warpage is uh, caused because you have just a small amount of shrinkage when the material cools down here, but you have a lot of area of shrinkage up here. So it pulls in a lot more at the top and it does down deep. So your material is gonna end up worse like this. Um, Whereas where with the laser, because we're not conducting the heat in the same way, uh, we, we have a focusing lens. The light comes into that focusing lens and is then focused to a very small point, um, which has enough energy density to uh, pierce a hole into the metal, like as if you're laser cutting. So depending on your power, you might not go all the way through, or you might end up being able to get full penetration welding. Um, this laser is actually kind of scanning side to side with the light weld to give you a wider weld path. So, uh, you know, your, your weld is probably a little bit 
bigger. Uh, the size is not accurate here, the difference between them. Um, this weld is typically a lot smaller up here. Um, but anyway, so you're able to get a very narrow but deep weld penetration. Um, also, uh, we have about 200 times the energy density of your traditional arc process, um, your average arc process. It kind of varies between what arc process you're using, but average is about 200 times energy density. So uh, we're wasting a lot less heat in the surrounding materials. So our heat affected zone is going to be a lot narrower. So that means our material is going to return its natural properties better. Uh, we're not wasting as much electricity. And then when it comes time to cool and shrink that weld, our weld is more uniform throughout. So we're going to have a lot more even shrinkage top to bottom. So our material will stay much more flat. Um, and then also because we don't have this arc that is, you know, a physical entity there. Um, the contaminants on the surface don't, they can't disrupt the arc since there isn't one. So, uh, and the shield gas that's coming out is actually blowing away any smoke produced by this material. So the, the light has a nice clean path to get to the material no matter what. We actually touch the surface with the nozzle so the distance is set. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of benefits of, of the laser. Uh, it's why it produces stronger welds with less distortion. It happens much faster, it's easier. Um, really the only downside of this is that you have to wear a different PCE. Um, so for yeah, a typical yeah. laser weld, would you not do full penetration? Would you go the majority of the way through the, the metal and then stop? Would you set it for that so that you don't... Because I imagine if you blow through the metal, then the metal you made molten would just fall out and get lost. You'd just be left with a hole. Is that correct? Um, not quite. So it's, it is possible to, to basically go all the way through the metal. Um, but because we don't have a high pressure assist gas, like a laser cutting machine, it, it pierces that same tunnel in the material, but then it has this really high pressure focused gas um, that blows the metal out the bottom, right? And it creates, it deletes this material, it creates your cut. The laser has a low pressure gas and it uses it just to keep the oxygen out of the environment. So that metal, um, you know, it's a fusion weld at least, you pierce a tunnel into the metal, um, and and then as it uh, moves along, basically this metal kind of fills in. It'll fill itself in and create the weld. So you're from a side profile of the weld. Um, this is kind of that tunnel there, and then this material as you're moving along is just continually filling back in that gap. It's not blowing the material out the bottom. So is, is the way to think about it that essentially it, it makes it molten for such a short period of time that it doesn't have time to, to fall out and drain out? Yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, it's actually difficult to make this thing blow a hole in the material. So, uh, you know, when you're vertical, if you're welding vertically, gravity is not really going to drip the material out this way. When you're welding flat, it's more likely to be able to drip this way because of gravity. But also the weld pool is so small, it's not this big, huge drop that's going to create a big drip of metal. It's just this little tiny thing. Um, and, and you're moving much faster, so it's melting and re-solidifying extremely fast. Um, so yeah, I haven't had that happen. I can, I can demonstrate during this demo for you on a scrap piece, but I can hold the laser static at too much power for the material, and it will take quite a bit of time for us to drop through. And sometimes I have to help it, like take a TIG rod and, you know, dab the puddle to make it drop through. Um, interesting. Okay. It's really interesting. It's hard to blow a hole with this compared to any other process. It's not. Yeah, it the sounds arc, like the surface tension helps keep the liquid in place. Maybe yeah. it's a big roll. And the arc's not going to like jump to one surface or the other and then melt this one away. It's, it's, the laser's going in its path no matter what. So you don't have that problem where it's kind of like wants to melt one side or the other. It's just going to go straight. And then if you're fusion welding, you know, um, you're going to, a lot of times, it, you know, even though the joint might be fit up nicely, you're going to have a small air gap in here. So it's borrowing material from here. So you might have a little undercut after welding. 
Um, so the wire is just basically going to compensate for that, compensate for any small gap. It's not really, um, uh, you know, the wire that you're integra integrating into the material might not be all the way through. It's just kind of going to add material on the surface and, and uh, you know, it might be incorporated down deeper into the weld, but it's not, it's more just to prevent undercut and to help you deal with any gap. Yeah, you're saying even if you're doing wire welding, you would not bevel before making a weld. You'd still have no, the two pieces flat against yeah, each other, and the wire yeah. just builds up some of the cratering. Yep, yep, because you can get, you know, quarter-inch penetration with this, no problem. You don't need the beveling. I actually like to do a very small bevel on butt joints, but not for the reason of helping penetration. Um, the reason I like to do a very small bevel here is because the wire on a butt, the butt joint is kind of the most tricky one with the laser um, because the wire can kind of, you end up pulling and it's, it's hard to stay right on the center, right? Mm. You're touching the surface. So it's a very tiny chamfer on the edge. I just take a sander sometimes. I didn't do it on this one, but I'll take a little sander and just kind of very quickly hit both sides. It gives this wire a place to rest. Ah, so I can stay on track. Physical track. track. Yeah, move exactly. Okay. Whereas this one, it's not a problem. The wire sits there because it's like an inside corner weld. Um, but on a butt joint, it's a little bit trickier. So um, that might be the easiest joint with most welders, but it's not the easiest joint with the laser. Really different. So there is a couple things that you might want to adjust with the laser uh, as far as your part fitment and tolerance to, to help make the laser a little bit more of an efficient process. So it's a very efficient process, but just like anything, um, you, it's best to tailor the fit of the parts for the welding process. And laser is slightly different. Okay. Um, and then as far as the gap goes, I'm gonna see if I can move the camera over here. Um, so the, the optimal shield gas with most materials uh, with laser welding is going to be nitrogen. Uh, so it has a lot of benefits. Um, it's much cheaper than argon um, because it is our mo most abundant gas in our atmosphere. I think argon is only like 3% of the gas in our atmosphere or something like that. So nitrogen is much cheaper. Um, it's easier to generate, you know, you could have a nitrogen generator if you wanted to do something like that. Um, we have laser cutting machines here, so we just have the nitrogen supply so that tapped into this regulator. And that makes it really easy because we just, um, you know, this light weld, it uses a little bit more gas than a pig welder, but it's not going to use anywhere near as much as a laser cutting machine. And it's probably it's hard to notice the difference on our uh, bulk supply system here. But you can use a tank. Um, if you, if you need to, for sure. And uh, what we want is we want a pressure regulator, and we're going to need to set our pressure between 15 and 30 psi on average. Um, the out the outlet from the regulator to the welder is a half inch outer diameter plastic hose. So you see that little green hose coming out of the end there. Uh, that's half inch OD. That one happens to be three eighths ID. So um, you know you can buy that at your local industrial supply store and cut it to length. And it's just a push the connect fitting in the back of the welder. Um, you know, I have back purge set up and all kinds of stuff going on here, but uh, really you just need the regulator with a 3 8 barb and going into that hose. And yeah, so the, the nitrogen provides less porosity with uh, with welding. It's just not capable to. You're not cap you're not allowed to use nitrogen with pig welding because it erodes the tungsten into the weld. Um, you can use it as a back hose, but you can't use it as the actual field gas. But laser doesn't have a tungsten, so it's fine to use it. It's actually better. Okay. Um, and then onto the welding gun here. A few things to note. Um, we have our umbilical cord here going into the bottom of the gun. This is our fiber. This is our gas supply line. This is and we wires for the switches and the lights here. Uh, there's two triggers. This is trigger one. 
This is figure two. Uh, during the weld, you'll end up being depressing them both at, uh, during the whole weld. The first one verifies that our door is closed with this green light, also flows our shield gas. When we make contact with our surface or our part, we'll get a continuity check, uh, which will create this light flashing. That, dispensing it through this wire that's clamped onto the table. You're gonna use this as like a ground, but it's not, it's not the same function. It's just sensing the putt. Um, so if your part has like laser film on it, you might just want to put this on your part because it might not make contact even through the table. But uh, which will be fine here with none of that. So put it on the, over there. Once we have the flashing light, we can then pull the second trigger, which will fire the laser. We'll have a red light here, and simultaneously it'll feed the wire. Uh, so our process is going to be something like this, where we you know use this little red guide beam to line up where our weld's going to be. Pull the first trigger, get the flashing light, pull the second trigger, and then we'll be moving along with our weld. And the, you want to hold the gun at about an angle like this. Uh, roughly 50 degrees is the optimal angle, but uh, it's pretty forgiving. We don't have to be right on. You just don't want to be straight into the material or like backwards. Uh, straight into the material can cause a reflection to come back up into the gun, in which case it has a sensor which will set off the laser so it doesn't do any damage. And then if you're too far back, your focus is going to be out of position, so your laser ends up being too far away. Uh, so by touching the surface, we have the correct focus system. The lens is here. Focus point's about here. Um, there's two consumable items with this. These copper nozzles are considered a consumable item. They don't wear out very fast, but they do eventually wear out. Um, there's a couple different styles of them. This is the one that I like to use. It has a little glue here for the wire. Um, so you can see here on the wire feeder that the wire kind of locates into that groove. I just use this one for everything for the most part. Um, sometimes I'll switch over to this fork nozzle for an outside corner fusion weld or a spot weld. But most of the time I just use this one. So it's easy to replace. Um, they don't wear out very fast. I make them last a month. Depends on how rough your surface is, really. Um, and then when you're using the wire, the wire is actually what makes contact with the surface, so the, the tip hardly ever wears out. And then the second consumable item is a small glass window in here. Um, it's a protective window. That little lens there. Try to open that briefly, but that window is a sacrificial piece of glass that protects the focus lens, which is deeper in the gun. So any contaminants that would come up this way will damage that glass rather than the lens. So the lens being a, you know, has a special shape to it to create the focus point. It costs about 85 or somewhere around like 100 bucks. I can't remember exactly. Um, whereas this Protective window is about twelve to thirteen dollars, so it's better to replace the protective one. So that's the second consumable item. The focusing lens is replaceable; it's really easy, but it costs more money, so I want to try to avoid that. And there's a little bit of focus adjustment here. Uh, in most instances, we're just going to have these nozzles just bottomed out. But um, in the case where you're using the fork nozzle you can get yourself into a situation where you're you're not in the right focus. Um, so for instance, if you have the fork that's like straddling an outside corner, that material is not where the focus point is. The focus point is here. So when the material is inboard of those forks, you're going to need to compensate that. And um, you do that by taking note of these millimeter increments these little tiny notches laser engraved on here. So however much the material protrudes inwards, you're just going to pull the nozzle out and then tighten that up. So we're just going to bottom it out for now. Other than that, that's uh, pretty much all the hardware and how it operates. 
Any questions before I do some welding? Oh, that's good. Thanks for the tour. No problem. Okay, so let me put on my welding helmet and uh, some gloves. And then I'll go through and do some tack welds and then uh, move on to some actual welding welds. Okay, so as I mentioned, I already did some tacks, but uh, I'm just going to add a couple here and there to show you. This is the time tack welding parameter. I typically don't use this because I just prefer to, you know, manually cycle the trigger to time my weld, but um, the tack welding is a nice feature because it makes it really consistent. You see those are almost identical there. Now this piece here, we can do the same thing. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And I apologize if I get in the way of the camera at any point. It's kind of difficult to see if I'm blocking it while I'm <laughs> focusing on welding. Right. Redo that one. to get this as accurate as possible. All right, and are you interested in seeing the uh, fuse weld this one, or do you want to see the wire main? No, adding wire there. No, so what he's doing right there is just, just tack welding with, with fusing. Um, I don't know that it matters. We'd like to see both, but I don't know that it matters which you do where. Okay, yeah, I can, I can just do both. I'll do a couple of uh, couple here and there. So. 
Try to get the best angle on this. Maybe vertical is the best angle. Get to that pretty good. What? Okay. So I will do it in this angle. I'll start with fusion welding. So I'm going to go back to that setting I was mentioning before for fusion welding, which is A1, start with 400 watts. What kind of load is this going to be? You're asking like how, how great are the forces that will be on the joints you're about to make? Yeah. Not, not very high. They, they basically just have to hold the weight of the assembly that you're building. Okay. Good. Yeah. I was just making sure, you know, cause I can, you know, I can go for like a deeper penetrating weld, but uh, it didn't appear to be something that needs to be like extremely robust. So. Okay, so I got uh, 400 watts. Sorry, go for it. The critical welds are going to be the ones on the the donut, the cylindrical shaped one, because that is a float, so it has to be sealed. Um, got it. You know, it has to be airtight. Okay, no problem. So the fusion welds are real easy. The only thing, the reason that I would say that I like the wire welds better is just because that wire is feeding you along at a really consistent rate. Whereas the fusion weld, I'm manually setting my travel speed. So I definitely don't need as much power as I'm using because I can see I'm getting full penetration there. On those next ones, I'll kind of lower the power down a little bit. Tip has to touch as long as you're welding. You can't let it float above it. Yeah, you got to touch the material. So the reason for that is so that you don't accidentally fire the laser off into the distance somewhere with you have to actually be touching. And then also it ensures that you're at the right distance from the surface for the focus. And you can see this, these parts are you know, getting warm within a couple inches of it, but it's not, uh, you know, it, it did, touching it, I think, is a good example of how focused that heat is. And it should show you also, I've only welded one side of each of these uh, pieces. Uh, right here, so you can see that the distortion is pretty minimal. It moves a little bit, but not as much as what you see with the, you know, pig process. Okay, so I'll go through and I'll do some more here. I'm just going to do half of the extrusion and half of the, with the uh, wire.
Okay. So I'll switch over to wire for these uh, for these next parts. And the changeover is going to be a matter of setting. I'll remove this nozzle. Put on this uh, wire feeder nozzle. I, I didn't show you the wire feeder yet, did I? I think I forgot to do that. So I'll show you that real quick. Wire feeder is pretty simple. Um, you're just going to use whatever alloy you need for your process. So I know this is 316 stainless. I have um, 308 wire in here right now. It's just I don't, I don't have any um, of the same alloy as your metal. But I'm just going to set my speed based on that chart. So let's see what it says. I, I like to go a little bit slower than what it says typically. So I'm probably going to go a little bit less than what it tells me. But yeah, so uh, 60 or 65 is going to be good. Let's go to 65. And then my setting here is going to be A2, about 600, 650. Give that a try. The wire is actually going to push me along. So it makes really consistent appearing welds. And it seems to be, they say fusion can be faster, but I typically see that the wire ends up being faster, at least in the way I use it. And what you see me doing there, kind of stopping, letting the wire get stuck, and then refiring the laser to cut it. That's the method I found that I like the best. Uh, on these ones, I'll show you what you see on a lot of people's videos. Um, with laser welding, and it, they just let it drop off the end. I, I just don't prefer that method. So they kind of just do that. But it leaves a little bit more oxide there. And the way that I do it um, tends to be a little cleaner. All right, so I think, and uh, did I get it off? Yeah, I got it off. Ooh. Okay. All right, so that's all welded up. It didn't really move around too much. Okay. Um, so next, I'm going to do. Uh, this weld this is the order I figured out. That ring, if I need to kind of grind it where those rings go, I can do that. But uh, maybe, yeah, because I can't really get in between when those rings are on there. So the only way for me to get this all the way is to uh, weld it first. This, uh, are you trying to achieve a full penetration weld on this, or as long as it's sealed, is that good? What's most important is that it be sealed. Okay. Um, you know, we've tried to, we'd like to get it most of the way penetrated through, but full penetration is not a requirement. Okay. They PT the backside of that. Penetrant, um, liquid penetrant gets stuck in there. Uh, it fails a good PT so I, backside. I, I've used backside and. Oh, you do both. that. Okay. Yeah, so that's why I do both. You use, you use the backside and then weld the front side? But I do both. Okay. Would that um would that gun assembly actually fit inside to weld it from the ID? That might be a challenge. This that would work will, actually. It, it will fit inside, yeah. 
Uh, the different, the difficult part is going to be what you're looking at because you're either looking through here or through one of these windows, um, yep. and you can't go sideways like a TIG weld. So uh, that little chamfering deal that I was talking about is going to be tremendously helpful if you're welding it inside. Okay, so it sounds like we've got options if we go this route to kind of figure out our, our new technique. Definitely. Are you pulling or is pushing? It's pushing me. I'm just making sure I'm maintaining okay. my angle. Okay. I'm going to stop here and just kind of look at it. Good. Our penetration is like spotty on the backside. We're getting full penetration, actually, but it's kind of like, you know, it maybe could use a very slight bump in power or a little bit slower travel speed to get more consistent penetration. And I'm just looking at it to make sure I'm staying right on this line. If it had the groove there, I could practically close my eyes and do this. I see I went off a little bit at the end there, so I'm just going to touch that up. And then right here at the ends, it kind of ate away. You got nowhere to go. So I can either try to add material like that, or I can, a lot of times I'll actually take some pig rod. Um, one of my hands, if I let's say if I were to blow a hole in that or something, I could pick, take a piece of pig rod, turn the power down a bit, turn my wire feed off, and I could manually add some material there on the end. That's how I make repairs. Uh, the, the, trying to make a repair where the wire's feeding out of a feeder, uh, kind of a high speed, it can be a little finicky, so I find it easier to just keep some of these on hand. I just use my scraps to put it. Hey, did you want to like clean half of that? Yeah, yep. So you can see the penetration where it's just ver on the verge of full pen the whole way down, which is kind of what I like to look for. Um, if you needed the full pen all the way down, you could definitely do it with only that. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, about exactly what I was at, but somewhere around 650 watts, and you know, we can go up to 1500, so definitely not pushing anything to a limit here. Um, yeah, but I'll go through and I'll do a cleaning action just so we can see what that looks like. So, the cleaning mode is going to use a different tip, so. Remove this one. I'll select uh, one of the cleaning nozzles. This one is for the SR. Yep, SR. Uh, so this one's going to just give me a different way of contacting the metal. It creates a larger clearance for a wider laser beam path and gives better gas coverage. So put this guy on. I'll go to a cleaning setting, which is going to be uh, C0 for low intensity. This is not very oxidized, so I'll, just, I'll go with that low intensity one. C0. That's going to give me a default of 15 millimeters. That red beam. I can narrow that down if I see fit. Just going to make sure I'm nice and centered on my part. So I'll just do half of this. Compare. That'll help out on the titanium. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, sitting there. <clears throat> and you can change the power and make it a little bit less evident that it has been done. Um, you know, this, I can't catch my nail on it. it, it Supposedly gets about two microns into the surface, but you can see it just brought us back to some clean stainless there. Okay. So when you weld like that, can you use backing gas to help from yeah. sugaring on the backside? Yeah. Okay. I can just use nitrogen, nitrogen for that also. You, you can't use argon on the backside? 
you can, but nitrogen is better. Uh, nitrogen is the, the optimal shield gas for stainless steel and, and uh, steel. Um, again, this is not something that you, you can use with rig welding, so it's, it's not uh, common knowledge that it's actually better. But with the laser, you're able to use it. So some people actually backward with nitrogen with rig welding, uh, just to save some cost. Just to say, you got to be careful that it doesn't go up into the arc area because then it'll screw up your tungsten. Okay, so I'll take the screen nozzle off. Let's uh, and weld up this ring. I see a little bit of a lecture from my tax. I want to cover that up. Field there. All right, and then. Um, Let's see, I'm not sure the best way to do this. Uh, maybe you can give me some insight. Would you weld these rings on? Or no, you probably slide them over the other part first, right? Well, once it's welded, like the way you got it now, I slide, I slide them in. I use a rubber mallet. Nope. I, I put the donut together first. Oh, you put the whole donut together first? Yeah, and then slide it over top. Okay. And then this fits together like in corner to corner weld. Is that what it does? Um, I usually do a corner because it's easier to TIG weld. But if if you can do it flush with that laser welder, it'd be awesome. It just depends on this. The fit up of this yeah. ring. <laughs> We're trying to figure out if it just fit inside. Almost fits inside. Huh? Dimensionally, yeah. it should fit inside, right? Yeah, it should yeah, fit inside. Um, I just, yeah, I tap it all the way down and then flip it over and all tag right. it. All right. Ah. <laughs> if you're not cut, yeah, it'll pop out. <laughs> if you're not cut, it'll pop out. You have a little preview yeah. of it. There's so much delay. So I'm going to kind of maybe just pack it while it's down. Or not, I can flip it over. In slow motion. This one actually looks like it's good enough that I could actually just use weld this. And I think that's the easiest way to go. So I'm going to go ahead and take fuse weld there. If I need to add wire in some spots, I will, but the setup is like really nice. So let's go with that. You had the right setup. You could almost do that on the rotary, huh? Oh yeah. I don't know if our rotary will grab something with this diameter, but yeah, you can definitely do this in the rotary. Maybe I'll try. I'll just pack it first, and then I'll I'll get let's see how it works out. 
Are you guys doing it on a rotary or just by hand? I do, I do rotary. Okay. Delayed. <laughs> the video delay is funny, but if you're watching the little one on the corner, it's all yeah. delay. He's in the back side. Hey, he did. He uses the front side one. Okay. I got that orange rubber mallet. See, with the uh, the TIG rig, you have to um after welding it, you have to take it to my um. My trough, it's got a stainless strip on it, and I smack with a rubber mallet to get it flat again. Mm -hmm. That he didn't even have to worry about it. No. Wow. Because it didn't deform at all. Right. Okay. So that that way it, it had pretty much fixed that gap right there right. where the two meets. He's trying to get a spot to weld without my somebody can't walk in while I'm welding. I would just tell them. You call in there, you. Yeah, you know I mean, people ask me questions on an hourly basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for, for this little this little bit here, I have a little bit of a bulge that's preventing it from getting flushed. So I would typically try to sand that down. Sand that but down. yeah, I want to try to show you what happens if I just hit it with the laser and kind of melt it in. So I'm gonna get this ring out of my way. And then uh, kind of blend that in. was pretty handy also. Well, thing about that. See if that helps out a little bit. I, don't, I, I wasn't in camera. I apologize for that. I was trying <clears> to <throat> kind of blend it with the laser a little bit. I've never had one to leave.
<laughs> a little bit of PT. Oh, yeah. In there. This I went to Salt Lake City. You put measures and pipe for right here. That was it as far as I went. All right. Cool. So let's see if I can hook this up on my rotary. Uh, in reality, I can just do this by hand. It's pretty easy. I could just stimulate a rotary. Not so oh. think it's going to be able to fit on there. Uh, to be honest with you, so. I mean, if, if you do it by hand, I think that's fine. I don't think we need to. What kind of rotary you got? It's like a little tiny one. It's not very, uh, it kind of goes like this. <laughs> it's not very well, yeah. uh, centered, but it does work. So you can see if it'll fit on there. We have, we have those here. The one is slightly bigger, Mike. Yeah, I just don't know if it's gonna. It's so gonna. It's well gonna. These will fall out. That's the only thing. You have to flip your arms around. Oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> so when you yeah. weld that, that the outside corner, it won't warp on you and like kind of flare out. Maybe a little bit, but not much. I usually tack it to that um, that round piece that's got windows cut in it. I'll go ahead and fit oh. that up and have it okay. all together. Do that. Yep. So that's a 2020. It should be four and a half inch from yeah. bottom to top. It seems like the warping isn't as severe as those. You see me sometimes. You're fucking well in that. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm going to hit it with a carbon hammer, though. Okay, so you said four and a half inches from here to here? Yeah, yeah from... you, you got it close enough. Yeah. It's got a little okay. bit of protrusion at the top. That's what we're looking for. Okay. So when you see the gap, I just use the clamp and clamp it and tag it. That... Close up the gap. That's about it. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, there is a little bit of a... Uh, again, I probably should have tried to sand that down a little bit right there. Because it kind of holds it off with that weld bead. But yeah, I can try to... Nowhere near as bad as what I get. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'll just use a clamp and do, do my best there. Okay, so let's do some tack welding. Uh, this tip is not really going to be the best for the inside corner, so I'll probably change it out. Uh, I like to just kind of have extra nozzles sitting around that are already set up. And, 
hands over is real nice and easy. I'm a life down them. Seems like there's probably two or three nozzles that would be used for this, and you just swap yeah. out as you go. I just I only use two of the of this selection. I think there's like four or five total. Getting into a little bit of a gap here, so. We're going to work with this. Good enough to me. I don't know if my pack, I'm doing a powerful enough pack to hold that tension, but we'll see. Maybe I'll do it. Kind of power a little bit for that. A little bit more robust pack. Pull that in, so let me add some more here. Ooh, now it's going to be a little tricky. I don't think I'll be able to tack that one without a wire. Pretty uh, viable. Yeah. So I'll probably go through this section with wire, and then I'll do the rest of the fusion. I think if we had flattened that longitudinal weld before assembling it, we would have been able to do it all without wire. Yeah, so long as the, the size of this hole is just right with the circumference of this thing. Yeah, I should have, I should have gone ahead and done that. I apologize. That's fine. Your your demonstration is showing us what it's what it's capable of, and that's what we're interested in. Alright. Get these jobs out of here. Last one to go in.
responders. The microphone picks up only his voice and none of the background noise. None of the background noise. Yeah, it's a real, real cool microphone. It actually doesn't go in my ears. It uh, sends vibrations into my skull. Isn't that weird? Oh, weird. Yeah, I have, I have, I have uh, earplugs in because I can't hear, I can't hear with these unless I plug my ears. <laughs> the weirdest thing. Okay, so for the settings here, and I'll end up having to hit that one section with wire a little bit, but I'll just kind of let it run until it can't weld anymore. I'll start about here and work the way that way. I'm going to do stainless steel, and my setting is going to be probably about um, 450 watts diffusion. So A1450. It might be really hard to not get in the way of the camera. But that's all I got. I'm probably going to, to manage the cable, I'm probably going to weld it from up here. That was a little too fast. Actually, it's not too fast, but it's need more power. The thing shakes. It kind of like doesn't like to go really slow. So let me maybe drop the power up a little bit. It was a little low shake. Not adding wire. That's why I have no wire. Hmm. Wire, because the the wire is that extra line that's bigger than that tip. And because I didn't have this fixed, you probably saw the gun was kind of moving around a little bit while I was touching the surface. So I might have to go through and make sure I got everything, you know, welded where I did. So what I'm looking for is that the laser is wobbling side to side. If I did any spots where I went through too quick, I'll see those wobbles. And I might mm -hmm. like right here, zoom in on that and show you. I might want to go through and touch this spot up right here. I'm going to zoom in and show you what I'm looking for. Pretty much everything else looks really sealed up, but. No, not really. Uh, well, anyways, you can kind of maybe see a little difference there in the finish. So I'm just going to go through and kind of run that over. Yeah, it's not really focusing on it, but I'm sure would kind of see it. I'm going to just go through the whole thing and kind of make sure I do that anywhere I can see it. A little bit thin right there, but I don't think this one would be, but I want to. Make sure.
So I think that's good for the fusion. And then I'll just probably do the rest with wire. I'll show you what the other side looks like with wire also. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to do the outside. Do the outside of the season first. When you got a gap that big, do you you walk it? Walk in the um. A no? little bit, yeah. Okay. The slight adjustment I added some width to the wobbling action. I can radius this corner a little better. Yeah, right. With titanium, too. Yeah. We had to use argon though. Yeah, you use argon. part is getting it to slide. You gotta keep contact with the metal. You can, uh, there's a way if you have this all fixtured up, you know, where you could defeat that touch contact with the clamp and the nozzle. But just gotta keep in mind, it goes against what's recommended for the safety protocol. Um, but I, th I think on like a fixture joint, it's probably, uh, as long as, you know, the fixture is pretty stout, it's not gonna fall over or something, it's probably not too, too bad, you know? Um, but you could just yeah. lightly hover it with that. And I've seen one person make uh, like a roller setup. And this nozzle, so this nozzle is a little bit messed up too. I don't know if you can tell. Um, I think if I went to a, well, that wasn't a little bit dull, but it probably function a little bit better. I'm just going to do that. Uh, yeah, it was kind of tacking in the next material. On this new one. I welded. If I would have welded that much of it, much tax he's got. He only got what, maybe eight tax. Mm -hmm. It would have curled up mm. and warped that whole thing already. That's why I got put so many tax down before I could start. Yeah. If if I don't, it's just gonna warp and I'm chasing a hole. Right.
that happened today. Position and just keep rolling with it. It's not even hot enough to melt that freaking label. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have to remove I'm wondering it about when I get to that. Put the one below it. Usually it'll turn black. Pass around, gentlemen, you know, for any potential loose points. I kind of touch anything out there, think maybe doesn't look optimal. But the one little tiny panel right there at the end of the weld, so I'm just going to hit that. Do it into the greatest job here. Sit there and do it like that. Blaze it. It wiggles. Mm -hmm. I'll do this inside one with wire when I go and do that other gap, but I'm going to do this wiggling. on the metal. Yeah, it's wiggling. It's in the wiggling. Can't tell if the machine's making any noise or not. The welder, all you really hear is like the hissing of the gas. Huh. Kind of like a little sizzle sound, but it's pretty quiet. Kind of like a if you're a K welding with steel or something like that. So it doesn't bother when it when it has like paint or something in the way. The weld. Paint, it doesn't really like the main. What you got to consider is that you can't conduct electricity through a lot of things that are on the surface, and we need to make that touch contact. So when you come across that tag right there, and if it's touching the tag, not the metal, and then short out. Well, the other side, the other side of the table. I just, yeah, I just probably won't. I won't even touch the tag. I would imagine. Why his arc is now? Looks like I'm just gonna make sure that that's sealing. It looks like it is making a nice weld. Maybe I'll turn the power up just a little bit.
I did touch the tag. We can see the rotary definitely makes a little bit quicker work of things. The trigger, is it like touch sensitive? The more you squeeze it, the more power you get, or is it just set at the one power? It's that. As it's set at one power? Yeah. really consistent though and it's like I said it's kind of hard to burn through so it's not quite as necessary to need the up or down on the power. Um, you can adjust the ramp up and ramp down scaling of the power though. So you can make the power kind of like come in slowly and trail off slowly when you let off. With titanium you just if you just let off it's just going to blow it's going to leave a little pinhole every time. Yeah yeah you exactly. Set it to ramp down All right, so I'm going back to a wire welding setting. wire is setting my pace so it's going to be really consistent i'm just kind of making sure that the gun's in the right spot on my part is that an angle that i can manage and that the wire of the gun is not running into my belly because then i probably go like up or down a little bit on the part so if i kind of crashed into my stomach with the umbilical cord part of it You don't want to try to move the part like I was doing. It's probably easier to manage to do this where you let the weld stop, move it, start again. Starting stops are not typically difficult to make field with this. Uh, you can also put a speed delay on the wire so it starts the weld a little bit more before it starts the, the laser. I don't have one set currently. I do have a retract set. And I'm going to let this go until it basically won't bridge the gap anymore. Right there. See that? And then it'll start bridging the gap again. And that'll tell me where kind of the general area where I'll need to go through and go over it again. I'll probably just go over it again. If it's too big, you gotta weave it, but if it's not that big, you can typically just kind of make a second or third pass over it. <clears throat> three passes, three passes over that to get it fill in. Okay. And you can see even where we went over a couple of times, uh, if you look at the penetration there, it's still uh, not overheating the metal too much. This is the rest of the way around. 
So some of these welds we did with the wire feed and, and some without. What, what would really kind of, in your mind, dictate when you use the wire feed and when you don't, presuming you have that ability? Well, the gap. You got to oh, get okay. wire. So the gap, you need the wire. I like to use the wire all the time, personally, but the only thing I don't like to use the wire on is this, and that's because it's uh, you're trying to balance that wire on like a really fine corner there. Um, depending on how you fit up the joint, though, that that could be fine. So go back over to some poker here. Um, for instance, if you have the joint fit up like this, the wire is the easiest one because that wire will rest in there. Yeah. Right. The nozzle there, laser weld. Uh, but because this one was fit up like like this, it's really hard to make sure the wire stays right here. So that having the fork tip kind of favoring the nozzle in this direction, so the, the weld is kind of going through the material like this, is uh, my right. favorite method. So depends on the joint configuration. You can redesign this part to where it would all work really good with wire. It already pretty works. It already works pretty well all around with fusion. Uh, the wire just yeah. kind of makes these look more consistent. Okay. Right. If you do burn through, huh? So if you do burn through, you just just grind out. Yeah. Uh, it looks, oh, I need to do the gap here. This one might, uh, this one maybe I'll try to show you what it would look like if I kind of had to build it up a little bit more. It, it takes quite a little bit of manipulation with the gun. Or you can kind of pause and let the wire build up, maybe a little side to side like this. Yeah, your head's kind of in the way. Uh, I'm sorry. The most difficult part of that, though, is just making sure that the wire remains in contact with the material. So you just kind of have to keep it buried in there while you're moving along. But you can see you can kind of just wiggle it side to side to jump across the gap. Okay. Not as fast. Introduces a little bit more heat. So it's definitely, in my opinion, the best bet to just Fit up the part a little bit, take a, take a little bit of some time making sure your fit is good, and then you don't have to worry about that. Right. I'm oh, sorry, I picked the labor a little bit. And then I uh, see on the back there, it'll introduce some more heat to it. It's still not tremendous burn through. Yeah. Okay. Now we got this part. And this um not looking at over. This just kind of drops in like this somehow or is it the other way? Yeah, flip it over. Yeah, put the inner ring first, the bottom ring. Then you can put that fin in. The, the bottom ring we sent doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. That's where I want. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, ran and said, I said, we need to get the right ones. We'll build the whole thing, but hey, all right. Exactly. And also, just so you can see, like, after all that welding, it's getting warm, but it's not, not insane. Right, we noticed that. I wouldn't recommend going and touching the parts with your bare hands, but you know, it's not a fire. <laughs> okay. So, back to the yeah. This is flush with the bottom, is what you're looking for? Well, no, that ring on the bottom is usually a quarter inch up, but you don't have that quarter ring inch in way. there. Well, there's another ring that we sent, yeah. but it don't work. Yeah. So oh, that's right. that's right. This guy. Let's just up a quarter. Yeah, that other ring, it don't fit. 
Oh, it doesn't fit. Yeah. Okay, okay. We so gathered up that one. a bunch of. Yeah, we gathered up a bunch of spare parts, and it turned out that one didn't fit with the rest. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Then eyeball the quarter inch, and then you have to weld up. Usually, that bottom plate will be in the way of you welding it, though. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, the ring. Nice. Yeah. You can't you can't weld the ring afterwards. I usually weld the ring first. But you could weld the ring afterwards. Yeah. Afterwards. If you set it in the right spot. If you don't set it square, that that yeah. far is not centered. Yes. Then you get the wobble. Yeah. You may try to weld it with the ring there, just kind of for reference. Hmm. Yeah. Well, no, nah, it shouldn't matter. I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is telling us that there might be a little bit of tweak to our assembly sequence that would be required if we use the laser welder. But what you've shown us so far is that the laser welder can do all these joints. Yeah, I want to yeah. see him do these joints. I tack one on top, one on bottom, and side to side, make sure everything's square. That that joint only gets one weld, so you don't have to weld. On one side. Yeah. Okay. But I think it needs a change too. I think it's a lot stronger. Yeah. Stronger how? Huh? Two wheels. One wheel. Oh, I see you saying. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, I see. All right. Um, can I show you one other feature of this thing that I think is pretty cool? Yeah. I'll show you the spot welding. I don't I don't know if you'll be doing any of this, but it's a pretty cool feature. Um, so I'm gonna turn off the wire feed and then we install this guy here. And put that up here. That's kind of a fun piece to weld. <laughs> Some stuff. You know, people just send me butt joints and I just gotta do butt joints for, for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a cool, interesting thing. I'm going to do a little bit of setup here so I can get this right. I have to burn it. There's a lot of heat run through that exhaust. I don't think it'll push out enough wire. All right, that should work. Okay, so uh, I'm going to weld. This is kind of like an example of the spot welding thing, and I'll show you a more traditional one, but I'm going to weld through this piece into the edge of this piece. Like a little bit of a guide here. I'm going to stay right on mine. Are you going to weld through it? Yeah. All right, so I got to turn my power up quite a bit. So let me go over to my machine. I'm actually going to use the setting that I already made with custom setting. Mm -hmm. 
Cinco quarters. Quarter. This is three sixteen. Wear glasses. Ready? I'll zoom in on it. Wrong setting. I have it up home. Sorry. Kind of look at it and see what we're getting there. Pretty good. I think I might need a little bit more concentrated energy, so I'll narrow the beam down a little bit. Okay, so you see I welded from there into this one. Um, I can't really tell how much penetration it got, but we'll hit it with a hammer and try to find out. Holding gun out of the way. Breaking the clamp. <laughs> yeah, I think the clamp broke. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're able to break it. But anyways, yeah, see, I needed a little bit more, either slower or a little bit more narrow weld to get all the way in there. But kind of an example of the spot welding condition, see with a thinner material, more practical case, um, it's pretty easy. Doing the quarter panel. That's yeah, certainly a capability the conventional machine doesn't quite have. Yes. And there, there's another way that I've seen done on auto body quite a bit recently in uh, manufacturing. Like BMW, I think, is the one that's using this. Probably a couple other companies, but um, it's a zigzag spot weld. So I can control with a custom setting, I can control the wobbling very precisely of the laser beam mm. so i can uh i can do something like this i think these are stainless hope so Oh, no, as a body, the body man had to cut that spot weld out. <laughs> I'm already hating that spot weld is in it, and the cars is in there now. That's like oh. something that they're doing on some modern auto body stuff. Uh, you can go through like, you know, three, four pieces of metal, so long as it's within the range that it can penetrate through. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of cool. See if I can lay down a really fine weld here on the edge too. That's cool. I mean, it looks like it's well capable of doing all the joints that we would need it to do. 
for our application. Hey, could you could you go back and, and clean like one of those edges on that float? Sure. That's one of the things y'all want is clean too, right? I'd like to see that the outer edge there and see it clean it and see how it looks. And the will it clean titanium as well? Yeah. You can lay down a little. Clean one of those outer edges. Clean one of those outer edges on that float. Okay. Is it possible to set it up wrong and blow through it while you're cleaning it? While cleaning it, uh, not really. <laughs> Uh, the, cleaning, the cleaning function, the energy is so spread out. I guess if you really set it up wrong and you turn the wobble all the way off for the cleaning, it might be possible. Um, but the way the settings are out of the box, I don't think so. I use a bit less power. Oh, you know what I mean? They're wrong. Sorry, there's different nozzles for the XR and the not the normal one. So I'm I grabbed the wrong one. Sure, the fine tuning, you get it down. Oh, yeah, you Perfect. get it there. Yeah. With some of that, then you probably. You need to. Different tips. Different tips for different jobs. So, for the outside corners, I kind of like to hit them. I see, I need to kind of figure out my position I'm good, but I like to hit them. Uh, from two corners, because it doesn't do quite as well when you try to get it right on the corner. Yep, I gotcha. Kind of one's from the outside, one's from the inside. Yeah, so I'll do a single pass like this. What if you did that inner weld down there? What, how do you do it? You need to narrow the boom down. It's too wide for that, so I'm gonna go a little narrower. So for for what we just assembled, the XR versus the XC. Do you say there's any significant advantage to the XR model over the XC? The XR model is going to give you the ability to do more. Um, with this, this material, you can do this with any of them, but these kind of fine corners, and like say you wanted to weld this and have less chance of going through back here, you're going to have more control with the XR. Okay. Essentially, because it has that higher energy density, um, it lowers the minimum energy threshold necessary just to melt the metal. So the Got XC it. and the base model have trouble melting the metal at really low power, but the XR does a good job with it. Makes sense. Okay. All right. Any anything else you guys want to see or any questions? Questions. Can you send us one for a while? Let us demo it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want you want me to send them back? Is that what you said? <laughs> no, I want you to send us a machine so we can demo it. 
<laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. You got to talk talk to the boss about that one. <laughs> oh, that. That's your word, boss. Right, you got another question? No, not really. Okay. I, it looks like I just got to fine tune it. We do get one. Just yeah. Fine tuning, playing with the settings. Definitely recommend kind of cataloging what settings work for what, and then having like a procedure. Uh, that's what we typically um, suggest for people to do because you know you can't just have somebody get on who's never used a laser and expect to know it, even if they know a TIG. Right. But if you have the settings down, it's, the machine is very consistent. So the same settings are going to do the same thing every time. Yeah. Okay. Well, this safety, safety protocol you gotta have with that area set up. Yeah, that's easy to do. We just yeah. build it, build him a wooden, not wood, but build us some kind of solid, solid structure. If we even if we put ten up or something, you know, maybe down um, by wood, where they work, you know, where we have the. Uh, the I kind of show you what we, we work with out here. I got my not buddy. He's welding out here on some aluminum stuff. Cam used to be Tom, whatever the name is. That's that's how we make our panels. That's kind of what they look like over there. That gray wall with the windows. Those windows are extra large, uh, not typical, but um, that's kind of what we're working with. Kind of what I'm in. They're durable in here also. Can be parts. Doing the that's TIG what, rod, right? Yeah, he's using a TIG rod by hand uh, to weld aluminum. We do that with these parts because these parts are pretty big. So maneuvering the wire feeder with a finicky wire to feed like aluminum is really tricky. Uh, the TIG rod makes it really easy. You just kind of lay it in the joint and then fuse over it. Yeah, well, this this is very helpful. Thank you for taking the time to do this. It definitely shows the capabilities of the machine and doing it on our parts is super helpful too because we got to see each corner of the joint and the way that it works. Okay. So, so if you had several of those and you got familiar with it, you know, fitting it up and welding. How how many of those you think you could do a day? <laughs> a day, man. It's always hard yeah. for me to uh, estimate that because I'm. I don't even know how well, long I mean, this demo took, but um, I'd say. Oh, just I mean, it's a, a bare minimum. How many you say? One, two, three. Oh no, I I. With with what I've seen with this, and once I get the hang of it, I'd probably do like 20 in a day, I'd imagine, maybe more. I don't know. Pro probably more. As long as the fit-up is good and it's consistently going together the same way, which it appears that these would, um, yeah, not not very – not. I can get quite a few done. But I'm the kind of person who tries to break my own record, so I'd probably get to like 100 or something. <laughs> <laughs> now he's getting exaggerated. <laughs> called hyperbole <laughs> yeah so yeah so I think the next steps for us are to look at where we would set this up and the, the, the cost of it compared to how fast how much we think it would accelerate our process from what we're currently doing and look at what we think the payback period would be and, and I think we would have to have a wire feeder too I think we'd have to do uh, the wire feeder Sounds I would like definitely XR recommend it yeah, yeah the XR the single mode fiber laser is said to produce a better weld in general. Again, the other ones weld great, but the XR is a superior machine for sure. It's so just uh, so the wire more, is the wire feeder talking to the XR, or how how do you know how how's it communicating? It's just an on-off signal, two wire connection. So it basically, like the, the light weld is closing a circuit, telling the, the wire feeder to go. That's it. Okay, and, and the a, wire feeder a, is it just a. Well, show me the wire feeder a little bit more. What is what? You got a spool of wire like a like a MIG MIG wire feeder? Yeah, it's pretty much just like a MIG welder, but it doesn't have the current going through it. Real simple. Right. So um, it's just a wire feeder to push it. Yeah. Okay. And it's just all you're doing is setting the speed, and you can do some delay and retract settings, but that's about it. And you just use normal wire. I didn't mention that. This is just standard like solid MIG solid core MIG welding wire. And I use uh -huh. 045 diameter unless my material is thinner than the wire. But for this piece, 045 diameter is perfect. You can use 030, 035, 116. Um, I like 045. Just what I found works good with this. You can speed it up or slow it down as much as you want. It's 116. But you, you can't. But you control your speed, 
separate on the wire feeder or your what you got to do is you got to control control your wire feeder separate from the weld machine or from yeah. the laser. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much like a meat machine. So basically, we can just take the wire feeder out there and. <laughs> what is it? What is the weld? Well, wire size? 045? 0, 045. 0, 030, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, whatever you want to run. Yeah, I have a customer that makes big stainless tanks and they're using one sixteenth inch wire because they're having a, a gap that has like a, a radius and then a flat meeting up to it and they want to try to make it flush. So they're using a little bit of a thicker wire to just introduce some more material there. If the fillet size is not a problem for you, you just want to make it welded up and sealed nicely. 045 is going to work good. Uh, the 045, as you saw in your part, practically filled that gap. I just had to kind of cover it one more time. An 030 wire, you might have to do some more manipulation to fill a gap. Really, the, the wire in this case, the most useful part of it is that it can physically bridge a small gap so that the laser doesn't just shine through the gap. So right. it physically creates a cover of it, and then the laser blends it all together. Too. They were doing that with the aluminum stuff. Right. Yeah, you could just take a tinker rod and just go right over it. Yep, that's what we do. The aluminum wire feed works good, but um, it's always a little bit more finicky. This doesn't have a push pull system, it's just a push. So, kind of feed aluminum wire when the conduit's kind of turned around, it, it can jam up. So, feel it never happens. Aluminum is a little trickier. So. The welding of it's easy, but the wire feed is the hard part. <laughs> so do you have a, uh, a wire feeder for titanium also? Wire feeder. You, you should be able to titanium. use the steel one. It's, it's a fairly rigid wire. Um, I, I don't have a spool of titanium. That's very expensive, and we just don't have one. But um, typically when we do titanium, we do use a fig rod. But yeah, you could definitely use a wire on this wire feeder, from what I can tell. What what that wire is that just pushing through some kind of rubber liner or is that a metal metal uh, wire in there? Like if a you're wire, dealing, like a big a big gun, your liner is it is that a steel liner? Yeah, so it depends on the material you're working with. If your material if it's a rigid wire, you'll use the coiled steel liner. Uh, if you're using aluminum, you're going to use one of these like Teflon liners. Okay. Just because it uh, doesn't. The aluminum kind of like rubs on the steel liner and it can like kind of build up and jam easier. So it's on the nice slick. Okay. Brandon, your checkbook? <laughs> My checkbook. All right, very good. I think I think you've addressed all the questions we can think of. So all right. We'll go we'll back and review it and um and reach out with any follow-up questions we have all right and i'll in the meantime i'll get this box up and back to you and then i'll have this video set to you as well okay very good thanks brandon <laughs> thank you thank you for taking the time to do this no problem thank you have a good right. one you too bye now okay.